We want to welcome all of you who are with us in the room. And uh, those of you who are watching online, I, I got word this morning that uh, there's a crowd creeping us from Oxford, from Croatia. So I'm just saying hi to all of you as a shout out. I also happen to know, uh, this is just for those of you who are visiting, that we've got um, two other groups that are watching us. One is a family called the Bears out on the West Coast. And the other one is the Ravenels, Jordan and Maggie, who are running loose in some car somewhere. So we're, we have them. I got word that uh, if heresy begins, uh, Westy has been instructed. Westy's my flight lead today for graphics up here today. We're going to see some good work on his part to keep up with my incoherence. But as we think about it, uh, they had passed a message on to Westy that if heresy begins, he's got a button to push. The power will cut. The jackbooted thugs will come in and take me out. And you guys can dismiss and go back to what you were doing uh, before. The, um, the challenge for us, I think, is to underappreciate how difficult it is as a pastor to bring sermons to help coach us every single week. That is a really, really tough job. And we need to encourage and cheer these folks on because it's really hard. It's easy for some guy like me to wander in here with something that I've talked about before and pitch it, right, and walk out. But it's really, really hard every week to put something like this in front of us as a congregation. So please cheer your pastors on as we do this, as we go on. Um, Okay, we're so glad all of you are here. I'm going to get really personal with you. I'm going to be putting my finger on your navel a few times today. Just think about that as we go through this. Uh, Our pastor has given us an assignment to work with. Uh, And that assignment is to continue his work in Follow Me, this concept of follow me. So we're going to unpack that today. And as we do that, um, we're going to think about the present day implications for that. How does it get personal with us as we go along with this? But Chris threw a twist into this thing, and that is we got to use the Old Testament. Personally, I was coveting 1 Peter 3.15 and hoped I could use that because I love that passage, but he stole it two weeks ago. So we're going to make do with 2 Chronicles 34, which in truth I love deeply. I'm so grateful for what we're going to hear today. I think it's going to stun you a little bit as you walk through this. The topic is called a lost art. Follow me. What are the implications for you and for me as we think about this? If you want a study guide, you can uh, email Rita at the office and she will give you the study guide with all the background references and citations because this material is riven throughout the Old Testament about Josiah starting from 300 years prior, we'll see that today, but also looking at the book of Jeremiah, Obadiah, Habakkuk, all these books, Second Kings, and of course Second Chronicles, lots of stuff to look at when you bring together this story of Josiah. So um, if anything I say today upsets you or gets you really frustrated or you feel like it's just heretical and I need to be burned at the stake. I would welcome your emails. Please be sure. Send it directly to me, Rage, all you want. I want to hear from you. My email address is randymadsen at (laughs) restandprez.org. Here's the plot that we need to work through. Three three words to hang on to, and then we're going to pick this out, right? First word, idols. Second word, disciples. Third word, follow me. Idols, disciples, follow me. How could it possibly be, as we read 2 Chronicles 34, that we could see this raft of infestation of false gods inside the temple of the Most High God? How could that have happened? The second question is discipleship. What does that mean personally for you and for I as we unpack 2 Chronicles today? As we begin to look at the deeper meaning of what it means to change your identity in Christ. And then we get to the follow me. Discipleship is the end of the beginning. Discipleship's the end of the beginning. That's where you begin the journey. And the follow me is that journey. And that's why we need to unpack that and be sure that we get that and deal with that. Third third point on this then, when we think about the follow me, is what was that secret, that game-changing, personal-changing, society-changing secret that emerged? Let's pray. Mm, Lord... Be with us today as you promised you would be with us. I pray your blessings, Lord, on uh, Chris and Zinnia and the family, on Jordan and Maggie and their family, Lord, as they travel for rest, for refreshment. I pray, Father, that today as we consider your word, make plain for us what is real. Take away from us what is false. Make plain to us, O Lord, what your calling is for us. In Jesus' name, amen. 
So for me, Second Chronicles 34 has got kind of this black star gravitational pull. It just sucks you inside the text once you start unpacking it, right? And the deeper I went in this thing, the more miserable I became about its implications in my life. And so since Misery Loves Company, I couldn't wait to uh, dump the, uh, present this to you so that you had a chance to encounter this same sort of joy that I've got going along with this. Um, you would really do my fragile male ego a lot of good if you would ask questions about this. There's plenty of deep questions to ask. And if you've got any pushback about what's going on, Andy Caldwell will be right here after church and you can talk to him about it and he'll answer your questions for you. So, Chris, that was a joke for him. Chris has been preaching a series called Follow Me and we're going to run that further deeper today. Why is follow me important for you? I, I, I want to just set up a sort of a worldview dynamic for you. In all of humanity, in every worldview, the same fork in the road stands for every person. It is either follow me, the most high God, with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength as a disciple, or you follow them. We're going to define the them in a minute. Follow me, follow them. That's the fork in the road. This is the second part of this, and this is really where it gets personal for us. Jesus made it really plain. Paul made it really plain. Second Chronicles is going to make it really plain. Your mission, your duty, your identity, your purpose is as a disciple on the journey of follow me. That's what this is all about. With that, Westy, if you will bless us with the first graphic. This is a picture of the signet ring of the chief financial officer of King Josiah. It was discovered in 2019, and it is the stamp to bequeath money, perks, food, power on people. Now, the interesting thing about this is, if you take a look at the map that we're going to put up on the board, our friend, the CFO, Nathan Melek was his name, was a commuter, kind of like Fairfax commuting into Washington, D.C., because... Josiah's administration is in downtown Old City, Jerusalem. And in the center of the picture, you see Old City, Jerusalem. The words may be a bit small for you. But he's commuting from out from the west and coming in. He was living out in the suburbs. And the reason why I want to point this out to you is I want you to start now watching this plane kind of go to a level set. Let's pitch the nose over. And Wes, to give us this picture of the dig. Now, the dig's just a little bit clipped. And for those of you watching online, this may be a hard look. But... There's a set of stairs here leading down into a well. And down there is where they found the signet. That was where Nathan Melek's home was, down there. But what's even more interesting is, take a look at the vertical distance up. You see the white barriers that run along. Well, you can't really see it with this clip. But above this bulkhead wall is a white, ro a white barriered road coming down. So you're looking at a vertical distance of about 60 feet plus another 50 feet to get to street level in Jerusalem. So people are up here walking around, and the treasure of Josiah here is buried this far down. And this is going to be our metaphor today to talk about discipleship, which is this. There has become, in the modern Western Christian world, a great chasm, a great span, a great gap between what the follow me of God is all about and what we think of as the sort of follow me. We want to explore that today as we go along. Let me start with the idea of Josiah's family legacy. His father, Ammon, gave Josiah a legacy of pecans. In other words, Ammon was nuts. <laughs> Josiah's father, Ammon, and his grandfather, Manasseh, did great evil on the side of the Lord. Manasseh's story is very complicated. We're not going to play with that today, but I really want you to catch this about Ammon. He did everything that he could to run away from God. Really a bad guy. And that was the father of our story character, Josiah, today. So we've got two generations of evil leading up to Josiah. Wesley's going to put up 2 Chronicles 33, 21 through 22. <clears throat> and I want you to see Ammon the father of Josiah, 22, when he starts, he only gets two years. He's killed at 24. Josiah takes over at the age of eight. 
He did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. That's not a one-off. That's a lifestyle. Ammon sacrificed to all the images that Manasseh, his father, made and served them. Ammon was all in for this polydolatry, or some people call it monolatry, but the whole point is a bunch of false gods. There's a lost art of the follow me. We don't understand it today. And I'm going to try to unpack for you why it applies to us as much today as it did in 2 Chronicles 34. And it's the same stuff going on. Here's why it's really important for us to think about this. What you follow shapes the legacy for the children that are following you. What you follow shapes the legacy of the society that you live in. I'm going to make the audacious claim as Christians the only hope a nation like ours has to restore statesmanship, civility, and an understanding of what is good and what is evil is if the disciples are out there. That's where this gets really close and personal. If you're living indoors only, it's a problem. So what did Josiah actually inherit? Two generations of evil. We just mentioned that. He was raised in that. Judah is a ravaged kingdom, okay? This is a rump state. It's been busted down badly. It's a vassal to a declining Assyrian empire and is being bullied by the nation of Egypt. Things are not well in the kingdom of Judah. But the fountainhead of the problem is not that a bunch of raiding armies came through. The fountainhead of the problem is that the false gods became the follow them and the follow me was forgotten. This is really important to get. Let's take a look at the portfolio of the gods. There's five of these that I'm going to mention today that were prominent in the temple in Jerusalem. There were lots more. There's a God for everything you could possibly want. Designer gods everywhere, right? But the altars and the high places throughout the land and inside the temple, Molech, the Baals, Milcom's, Chemoth, and Ashtoreth. Let me pick one of them, just one, so you get a sense of what's going on. Molech is the god of obsession. I want you to be deeply fearful and obsessed If you do not do what I tell you to do, you will surely perish. And you know what I want you to do? I want you to burn your children in the fire. That was Molech. I will make you so fearful and obsessed that you're not going to have a good life, that you are willing to take your children and burn them on the altar of Molech. So we have Molech with child sacrifice. We have the Baals with transactional prosperity. You do this, you get that. The Milcoms were about power and oppression, dominating all those around them. Chemoth was nationalism. You're with us or you're canceled. Ashtoreth, sensuality. Have a blast while you last. If it feels good, do it. We don't have anything like that stuff in America today, do we? This was social insanity. And I want to show you a passage right now, 2 Kings 23.7, just to take a slice. I want you to get what this says. The male cult prostitutes who were in the house of the Lord. This is inside the temple. Male cult prostitutes operating inside the temple of the Lord. How did we get there? The people of the follow me were in the follow them. But... No one thought this to be at all odd. It was normal. We're walking around while the truth of the follow me is buried down here. But we're smarter in Northern Virginia, right? We're sophisticated. We're moderns. Do you see any Molex around here? The same gods are among us. They're just rebranded. We're still following them. They just have a different veneer. We're oblivious to that gap, okay? So let's take a look at the consistent historical beauty of Scripture. I want you to get a sense of this King Josiah's magnificent place in history. I'm about to show you a passage about Josiah that would be the equivalent of somebody writing your story from the year 1724. I want to imagine somebody's writing your name and your actions in 1724, and they got it right. So here is... Our passage from 2 Kings 13. Behold, a man of God came out of Judah by the word of the Lord to Bethel. Jeroboam, bad king, 
standing by the altar, bad altar, to make offerings to a bad God. But here's the prophet talking to Jeroboam, but he's doing it indirectly, and he's talking to the altar right now, and he says, Oh, altar, altar, thus says the Lord. A son shall be born to the house of David, Josiah by name, 300 years before. He shall sacrifice on you the altars, the priests of the high places, who make offerings on you, and human bones shall be burned on you. And this syncs up perfectly with 2 Chronicles 34, verses 4 and 5. Josiah started a retirement program using some very sharp language, like as in swords, chopping up false prophets and priests who were working in the temples, and he ground their bones to dust and burned them on the false altars of the false gods. That might send a message. Something made Josiah different from his father Ammon and his grandfather Manasseh. What happened? And here the story about discipleship begins to explode for us. Let's take a look at 2 Chronicles 34, verses 1 through 3. Eight years old when he becomes king, he did right in the sight of the Lord. Okay, we got that. He did not turn to the right or to the left. In other words, that's an expression for a whole heart. I'm all in for God. Now, at this point, I'm going to argue he doesn't understand what follow me means, but he's all in. Okay, passionate, but no clue. In the eighth year of his reign, while he was still a youth, now he's 16 years old, get this, he began to seek the God of his father, David. Why? Why did he do that? Two generations of programming this way? Why is he going this way? What's going on here? The something that we need to understand is discipleship. That's what happened here. He had two mentors, two older guys who said, you're coming with me and here's how it's going to be. Hilkiah, the priest, Shaphan, the scribe. They shaped Josiah. And not only that, but they equipped him with wingmen, wing women, partners, teammates to go out into life together. One of those wingmen was Hilkiah's son, who's a guy named Jeremiah the prophet. And you can read as you go through the Old Testament passages, these guys had a relationship. These guys were connected. These guys were influencing each other and pushing forward. Clueless, but wholehearted for God about this whole idea of follow me. At age 20, Josiah starts to purge the land and the temple of the false gods and the idols. And he's personally supervising this. That's in Chronicles 34.3. Age 26, we see that he's forming what you and I at Rest Presbyterian would call the campaign committees and the building committees because he's getting ready to go do some renovation. And this is really important for us. In the 18th year of his reign, when he had cleansed the land and the house, he sent Shaphan, the son of Azaliah, and Masaiah, the governor of the city, and Joah, the son of Joah's recorder, to repair the house of the Lord, his God. There's a hidden treasury theory here. I can't prove it completely to you, but there's a lot of Hebrew literature and a lot of archaeological evidence that suggests that a lot of treasure had been hidden in the temple because the raiding parties kept coming through and stealing everything, so they hid a lot of stuff, and they put important stuff in there. And then they forgot about the follow me, and they started to follow them, and the room was pretty much just abandoned, not seen, not known. Interestingly, though, somebody knew about it, and when Josiah directed that the renovations begin, the people who knew about it, but had no clue what the contents were, went in and broke open the treasury and started pulling money out. And guess what? While they were bringing out the money that had been brought into the house of the Lord, Hilkiah, the priest, found the book of the law of the Lord given through Moses. Boom. That book is the book, the book of Deuteronomy. And it was hidden and it was forgotten. Hilkiah finds the book, and as a good disciple, he goes, Hey, Shaphan, get over here, wingman. Look at this book. They read it. Shaphan takes it to Josiah, and he said, We're going to read this. Second Chronicles 34, 19. When the king heard the words of the law, he tore his clothes. Now, this is not some Hollywood drama scene. This is big embarrassing, anguish, fright, and despair, because all of a sudden he got it. 
He could see the gap. He could see the expanse. He knew, oh my goodness, look at this gap between who we are and who we're supposed to be as disciples, as followers of Christ. When Josiah got it, he wanted everybody to get it. And this is where you see a disciple beginning to change society. But I'm not going quite where you think I'm going. I don't mean, yeah, some king can walk in and decree that the society would change. A guy who was a part-time priest and a guy who was a part-time scribe found stuff and related to another guy that they had been working with who just happened to be, that sovereignty, king. Society began to change not because Josiah is cool and smart and gets it all figured out early on. He changes a society because he gets it, and he gets it because his two mentors and his wingmen are saying, this is who you are, and this is who we're supposed to be. Second Chronicles 34, 31, and 32. Long passage. I'm going to summarize this for you. At the top of the passage, Josiah makes a covenant with the Lord. I've screwed up. I'm going to straighten up and fly. I'm going with you, Lord. I am going with you. In the second half, he's saying to everybody else, we're going this way. And as people hear the narrative, they go, yeah, we're going this way with the God of our fathers. Here's the question for us today as we begin to turn to final approach on this thing and uh, get ready to put the landing gear down, put this plane on the ground, right? Is 2 Chronicles 34 applicable to us? Does this Old Testament passage matter in the idea of the follow me? Statistically, we in the Western Christian Church do not get follow me. I'm going to cite some numbers. This is research. If you get the study guide from Rita, you'll see all of our citations and the research that work behind this. Here's a number for you to chew on. If you're between the ages of 20 and 45, Gen Z to millennials, 70% of those raised in the church as Gen Z's and millennials have walked away and will not be coming back. That's the stats. That's been a steady trend since 1998, and it's holding true. For those of us who remain in the church, here's a number for you. 93% of the people in the pews today say that talking about the hope that's within me, Jesus, the Christ, my Savior, 93% say, that's not my job. I'm not equipped to do it. That's for Chris and Jordan to take care of. I'll bring people in here and they can explain it. 93% say that. 82% of the people raised in the Christian church say, I have no Bible study, I have no prayer life, I have no fellowship group, and I attend church 1.7 times a month. We're inert. Inert, unequipped, unwilling, walking out the door. We don't get the follow me. We don't get it. Let's talk about traditions for just a minute because it's traditions that did this to us. It's traditions by leadership, leadership by traditions, society by leadership, leadership by society. You see this endless do loop of the follow they. William Wilberforce, the great slave emancipator in England, 1794. He was born in a Christian country. Of course he's a Christian. His father was a member of the Church of England. So is he. When such is the hereditary religion handed down from generation to generation. Did you get that? Hereditary religion handed down from generation to generation. It cannot surprise us to observe men, young men of sense and spirit, beginning to doubt altogether the truth of the system in which they have been brought up. Tradition makes for really lousy discipleship. Now, an American tradition is good Christians go to church. Okay. I'd like to change the paradigm just a little bit. Chris, don't have a heart attack. Hang with us. The idea of church is something like a gymnasium. It's a spiritual gymnasium. Chris and Jordan are our athletic directors, our trainers. They're here to help us improve how we work it out how we nourish ourselves, how we develop our lives. It's a gymnasium. But if you spend too much time indoors in the gym and you're not out on the field doing the mission, you're going to start losing the follow me. We need to be in church, but we don't need to be disciples who are pursuing churchianity instead of Christianity. Churchianity is I'm doing stuff. 
That's not discipleship. Those are symptoms of disciples. Worship, praise, caring with each other, building community, fellowship groups, those are symptoms of discipleship. But that's not discipleship. Those are symptoms. Now, the other side of the equation is workianity. I don't have time to be indoors at church. Catch it online. Go out there 24-7. I've got to get these people saved because if I don't get these people saved, God can't do what God wants to do. It's up to me if it is to be to steal from Norman Vincent Peale, which is bad theology. We have in the Reformed tradition generally defaulted, erred to, been too inclined to the idea of churchianity. It's all about fact infusion. It's my theology. It's my soteriology. It's my infralapsarianism. I get all these terms and all this stuff going in my head, and I'm just really smart, and we're here in church. We're the frozen chosen. That's the reform side. The Armenian side has the opposite error. I've got to get out there in the field because God can't handle it if I don't make it happen. Every single soul out there is going to die and burn in hell if I don't get them saved. That's workianity. Indoors, outdoors as extremes are wrong. The balance is what we're called to. We're called as disciples to be in that balanced relationship. We have the community and we have the outdoors. That's who we're supposed to be. There's three legs to this stool then. There's the indoor, there's the outdoor, and there's the personal. And this is where I'm getting back to your navel, okay? The idea that Jesus portrayed for us, Josiah portrayed for us, is the idea of a mentored, partnered, life long, no retirement plan development as a disciple. That's who we are. To say it another way, mentors, wingmen, disciple making. That's the three pieces, right? Your job description, no matter what your specialty is, is a disciple. Not optional in Christianity to not be a disciple. In that, you may be a bookmaker, a candlestick maker, any number of possible different things, but that's a core strength of yours as a disciple. Here is a passage I want you to see. 1 Peter 3.15. I wanted this passage and Chris stole it two weeks ago. <laughs> Sanctify Christ as Lord in your heart. There's some of the indoor happening. Always being ready to make a defense for everyone to give an account, a defense, a reason for the hope that's within you. Remember the word hope isn't the word wish. The word hope, elpis in the Greek, is certainty. You have a reason for the certainty that's in you. So, all right, we got the gear down, we're getting ready to land this thing. What's the now what? What are the personal implications here? We've got to get past churchianity and workianity. We've got to balance those. I have three diagnostic questions for you. And I hope it makes you just as happy as it made me as I began to work through it. The first question is, have you ever personally been discipled? I don't mean did somebody show up and get you to know who Jesus was and then walk off. I don't mean that you're part of a group. I don't mean that you're just sitting in a church doing stuff. What I'm asking is, has someone very influential in your life walked alongside you long enough to help you get the ropes and start walking into the outdoors? Have you ever been personally discipled? 90% of the people in the Protestant church today have never been discipled. Interestingly, this came out from uh, the Bonhoeffer Project a few years ago. 80% of pastors have never been discipled. I was just up at Gordon Connell Seminary uh, not long ago, and I was asking this question of the officers of the seminary and the professors in the seminary. It's an empty slate. We've lost what it means to be discipled. That's diagnostic question one. Have you ever been personally discipled? Second question is, do you have a wingman or a wingwoman? Do you have a Priscilla in your life? Do you have a Paul in your life? Chris was preaching about this a couple of weeks back. Do you have a Josiah, a Hilkiah, a Jeremiah in your life? Do you have those? Do you have someone like that who can see through you, who knows you? They can be there for you when you've got trouble, and they can help us push forward into the outdoor world. Because that can be kind of intimidating. Would you mentor someone? That's the third question. Have you ever been personally discipled? Do you have a wingman or a wingwoman? Are you willing to take somebody along with you? I hope in 2 Chronicles 34 you got this. These guys didn't know how to disciple anybody. 
but they did it anyway. It was obedience. That's where it starts. It doesn't start with theological competence. It starts with obedience. That's where all this begins. Jesus made this pretty plain for us. Luke 9, 23. If anyone would come after me, deny himself, lose my agenda. Take up his cross, Jesus' agenda. Follow. That doesn't mean like on Facebook. That means like pursuit. That means pursuit, right? If you do not do the follow me, you're doing the follow them. And if you're doing the follow them, what you're providing is irrelevant salt. You are salt without saltiness. You will not influence the outside world. And you'll just sit in the gym and you'll just wash away. One generation deep and then the next one comes along. How do you score on those three diagnostic questions? I want you to be able to ask leaders in your Christian community, whether it's in this church or wherever you happen to be, about this as well. Do not let leaders off the hook. Persecute and say, are you doing this, Dennis? You're up here tossing this stuff out. I mean, how do you score here? What do you think? Don't let me off the hook. It's time to unearth this lost art of follow me and start compressing that distance that we've got in the Lord. This is the journey that we're to be on. Are you miserable yet? Let's pray. Lord, thank you for the grace and mercy that you have given us in the resurrection. Thank you for the calling that you've given us. Have mercy, O oh Lord, that you will teach us to be patient with us and you will spur us on, Lord, to follow you with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you help the church think more about discipleship? Would you help us get the conversation started to talk about the biblical discipleship Jesus gave us? Please follow us. Our website, www.thediscipledilemma.com. You can find us on YouTube, LinkedIn, Instagram, Facebook, and all the RSS feeds. If you'd follow or like us, you'll help us get leverage in the digital marketplace to talk about the fact that discipleship needs to be talked about. And as always, folks, thanks for listening.